Hey guys, how does that reflector or director on your Yagi work? I mean, they aren't connected to anything. They just sit there. This video is going to show how a parasitic array works. It explains what mutual coupling is and demonstrates it in the field. I'll show how by understanding this and using your analyzer in the field, you can tune any two or three element Yagi or parasitic vertical array with confidence without the need for relying on modeled values and multiple iterations of element tuning. Look, even if you don't plan on building a directive parasitic antenna, this video should help you understand how that Yagi works. Let's get started. So let's start with an experiment in the field. I've got three top-loaded 75-foot verticals that I use in my 160-meter directive array. Now each element can be grounded or left floating. If not grounded, that element is not resonant on 160 meters. When it is grounded, it's been tuned to be a quarter wave resonant element on 160 meters. So let's connect my analyzer to this southwest element using this long piece of RG6 coax. Now I could put the analyzer directly at the feed point, but today it's kind of cold and snowy, so I'm going to make some recordings in the nice warm shack. You know, it's easy to do this by calibrating the analyzer to the end of that RG6 going, uh, rather doing an open short load calibration. Most analyzers are going to let you do this. Today I'm using the legacy AIM analyzer, but later I'll talk about using the rig expert uh, AA55 zoom and even a nano VNA is going to work. So after calibrating the feed line, let's do a frequency sweep from 1.75 megahertz to 1.95 megahertz across the 160 meter band. Here I'm just plotting R and X on this impedance sweep not SWR. Right now I'm not interested in SWR at all. I'm just sweeping the raw element with no matching network. This sweep is with those other three elements floating. As I explained, they're not grounded, therefore non-resonant and invisible. We get this nice, smooth, gradually increasing real resistance, R. All right, now I'm going to ground the southeast vertical. Now please understand, I've changed nothing to the southwest element that we just swept. Everything is the same. All I've done is ground the southeast element, which is about 100 feet away. Now when I sweep, we get this curve. Well, what happened? Suddenly, the real resistance has dropped at around 1780 kilohertz. Why? I mean, what's happened here? Well, the reason the resistance has dropped is because we're now coupling current into that southeast element that we just grounded. That southeast element is resonant at 1780 kilohertz, and like a tuning fork, it starts to resonate and causes it to build current. This is mutual coupling. Since that element is now sharing the drive current to the system, the resistance drops. Let me explain this with this old school graphic. All right, so with the parasitic ungrounded and open, it's non-resonant. No current is developed, and we are just sweeping a single element and we get a nice gradually increasing resistance in R. That's typical of any single radiator, either vertical or a dipole. When the parasitic element is closed, we begin to couple current into that element at its resonance point, and the resistance drops because we're now sharing the drive energy between the driven element and the, and the uh, parasitic. So let's look at it this way. When an analyzer is feeding current into the driven element, it's like lighting up a light bulb. It's putting current into that element. At resonance, the parasitic, when grounded, is also uh, inducing current because it's resonating, like a pitchfork, and absorbing energy, and so the light bulb is lighting up. Well, to follow that an analogy along, with two light bulbs in parallel, that's like two resistors in parallel. Ohm's law, two resistors in parallel, we're going to lower the resistance. The current and the power is being shared between both elements. At resonance, the current will be maximum in that parasitic. So now we have two re resistors in parallel, dropping the resistance at, to a maximum point. Away from resonance, the pitchfork will not be resonating in the parasitic as much, therefore there will be less current in that parasitic, and therefore the resistance will not drop as much, either higher or lower than the resonant frequency. All right, now why does any of this matter or help us? Look, I assure you it does help us in the field, so please stay with me here. 
Here is a frequency sweep from 4 neck 2 with just a single 160 meter top loaded vertical element. Just like our analyzer sweep in the field, we have a gradually increasing real R curve. Here, I add a second element into the model and we now see that same R dip now at 1812 kilohertz. That's where this element is tuned in the model. It looks just like the dip we see in the field, a drop from about 13 ohms to 6 ohms. Now look, here's the punchline. The same frequency sweep from 4 neck 2 will also plot gain and front to back as shown here, with the impedance sweep that I just showed below it. Now notice that the peak gain at 1830 kHz is coincident with the approximate midpoint of this rising R curve, while the front to back peaks slightly higher in frequency. This is because in this model, with the parasitic resonant at 1812, it is acting like a reflector above that frequency. Now this is the key. So going back to our analyzer field sweep, we now know that the maximum gain for this array, tuned as a reflector model, will be at 1826, or about halfway up the slope of the dip we measured in the field. All we need to do now is tune the driven element at this frequency for maximum forward gain, or say around here for maximum front to back. If that slope is not where you want your antenna to be tuned for max gain, well then just retune the parasitic, or put a roller inductor at the base and adjust it until that slope is exactly where you want it. Measure the roller inductor and replace it with a fixed unit. That's what I do in the field. I generally make my elements shorter than they need to be and fine tune the uh, parasitic with inductors. All right, so that's a two element design, but what about a three element parasitic? Well, look, I'm gonna describe that in a minute, but first, how do we tune or feed the driven element, the driver? Well, honestly, however you want, it doesn't matter. Whatever works best in your situation. So you could use anything like a, a Unin transformer, a stub, a hairpin match, or some other complex LC network. All we need to do is bring the element to resonance, resonance and match it. We can measure the X and R from the analyzer and plug those into a, one of the many online matching calculators. In my example, here on this sweep, halfway up the curve, where we should see close to max gain, the R is 13 ohms and the X is minus 52. Plug this in and we have some matching choices. However, no matter how you uh, match the feed line to the driver, the SWR bandwidth of your two element array is very sensitive to where, uh, that is what frequency you tune the driver. Okay, let me explain this. Let's say in our 4 neck 2 model, we want to tune the driver for 1 to 1 at max gain, here at 1830 kHz. Alright, if we do that, we get this really narrow 15 kHz 2 to 1 SWR bandwidth. The reason it's so narrow is because we, as we approach this maximum gain point, that resistance curve is very steep as we crash down the curve to the R dip caused by the parasitic. That's why the SWR is steep and narrow. The impedance is rapidly changing. However, if we tune the driver up here at the peak front to back point at 1846 kHz, we get a very nice broad SWR curve. That's because the R curve is not so steep here. All right, well this looks good, but hey, notice that the gain is really rather poor above this one to one point. Also, the peak gain down here at 1830 will be at the 2 to 1 point, almost outside the operating window. Well, hey, we could also tune the driver way up here at 1866 kilohertz and get this really nice broad 56 kilohertz 2 to 1 window. But hey, look, if we try and transmit down here at the peak gain point, I mean the SWR is 3 to 1. Yeah, that's not good. So tuning the driver perhaps somewhere here between the max gain and peak front to back seems like a good choice. Oh look, that's about halfway up the slope on the dip in the R curve. Hey anyway, this two element narrow bandwidth is why I have these tuning modules at each element. I can maintain good gain and front to back as I move across the band as cat data from the radio switches in the inductors based on band segments. All right, now if we have a three element parasitic antenna, a reflector driven director model like the K3LR style, then we're going to see two real resistance dips, one for the reflector and one for the director. 
This is a field sweep from my three element 160 meter array. Now, here are those same impedance and gain sweeps from our four neck two three element model. Notice the mid gain point is near the middle of these two R dips. So in the field, we'll tune the driver around here for maximum gain. Now, unlike a two element design, the three element array has much better gain performance. That extra director element really smooths and expands the gain bandwidth as shown here. Now optimizing a three element parasitic in the field is not a complex task. The only variable is how far apart you tune the reflector and the director resonances. There's no other variable. How far apart are these two R dips? Now I'm assuming, of course, equal element spacing. Of course, design optimization can occur by physically changing the element spacing, element diameters, and top loading wire placement. But for this example here, for this 60 foot element space model, if the director reflector parasitics are tuned 126 kilohertz apart like this, we get this gain front to back performance. About 5 dB gain over 100 kilohertz. Now if we match the feed line here at the mid gain point, we get this 67 kilohertz 2 to 1 operating window. Okay, now if we tune the director and the reflector just 54 kilohertz apart, we get this gain in front to back performance. Well the front to back isn't so great at only 13 dB, but the gain is over 1 dB higher at 6.3 dBi. But if we match the feed point to the driver here at the gain midpoint, we get this crazy narrow 26 kHz 2 to 1 bandwidth. Well that's because the resistance is rapidly dropping on both sides of our design frequency. All right, well here's the same exercise with a 96 kilohertz director reflector span. We have a nice extended 5.5 dBi gain profile and we can see about 44 kilohertz of usable 2 to 1 bandwidth. I personally will tune my three element array closer to the maximum gain and deal with the narrow SWR bandwidth by implementing those tuning modules to add all of the elements. That way the gain and SWR are always going to be maximized across the band. Also, since I use dedicated directive receive antennas, I'm not concerned about front to back. I want transmit gain. Look, each operator will have their own design goals, but whatever you choose, it's easy to implement in the field. Just put your analyzer on the driver and dial in the reflector and, di and director dips to where you want them. Then. Tune the driver near the uh, R peak between those two dips. By the way, in all of the 4NEC2 models shown in this video, I've inserted a 0.5 ohm series resistance in each element to account for losses. Without that resistance, all gain values will be about 0.8 dBi greater. Here are a few tips for the field. First of all, this resistance dip is subtle. In my example, it only drops from 17 ohms to 9 ohms. Hey guys, that's a small amount. It's only 8 ohms. If your analyzer scale is set logarithmic or to 200 ohms or more linear, which is often the default, then you'll never see the dip. You need to lower the scale to make it visible. I use 0 to 25 ohms if I can. This is very important and probably the main reason guys have trouble finding a dip. Second, don't look at the impedance sweep on the analyzer. We're looking at the real resistance and reactance curve. That's R and X, not impedance. Third, we're sweeping the driven element with no matching network, just the raw element. Remove any hairpins, LC networks, unins, stubs, or anything used to match the coax. Just connect the analyzer to the bare element. Another problem could be your ground system is insufficient to build current in the parasitic. Look, a vertical parasitic array requires a very good ground radial system to achieve mutual coupling. In fact, just observing the dip in the real resistance can be an indicator of how good or bad your parasitic radial system is. I mean, after all, one end member is not grounding one of the parasitics at all. I mean, well, that's zero mutual coupling. Listen, if you're not seeing a dip in the real resistance with your parasitic array, you probably aren't achieving any gain. There simply must be a resistance dip seen at the driver if current is being coupled into the parasitic. That's just a fact. Without current in the parasitic, there won't be any gain or front to back. 
The popular Rig Expert AA55 zoom analyzer will also work, but the screen on the handheld unit is rather small. Here's a field scan, and the dip is visible, but notice that I've set the scale for 0 to 25 ohms. That's important. Consider loading the Rig Expert Free antenna scope program and use it on your PC or laptop. But again, make sure you adjust the scale. It's a control click and roll the mouse wheel on the left axis. Notice, in this case, the scale won't go below 0 to 50 ohms, and that's almost too coarse to see the dips as shown here. The little Nano VNA will work too, but I recommend using the Nano Saver program on your PC or laptop. That little screen is just too small for me. Unfortunately, analyzers can become overloaded with AM broadcast band signals if close by. This can be a big problem on 160 meters. If you notice your analyzer dancing and bouncing around on 160 meters, with each sweep giving a different result, then you might have trouble with BCB overload. To my knowledge, no one's described a method like this for tuning a parasitic. Back in 2020, I did upload a YouTube video about this. I do some lab experiments demonstrating mutual coupling, and I also explain how to tune a Yegi in the field. If you want to watch that video, there's a link in the description below. Look, likely some of you have tuned your parasitic arrays based on model parameters, tuning the parasitic resonant frequency to match the model while isolating the other elements, doing field strength testing, and iterating numerous times. Look, I've done that too, for about 30 years. I've built a lot of Yagis and other parasitic antennas. A plug-and-play antenna built on in the field based entirely on a model, especially with loaded elements, is unlikely to be successful without field tuning. The method described here in this video is easier and always results in the antenna being tuned for maximum gain in front to back exactly where you want it, since measuring that real resistance dips is already accounting for all the field variables and unknowns. Hey, maybe experiment with this method. It doesn't need to be a 160 meter antenna. Maybe build a 10 or 15 meter three element Yagi and tune it as I described here. Hey, 73, this is Steve, V6WZ.